OK. <clears throat> so one of the main types of components in Gen 5 is the cache hierarchy. So the cache hierarchy is the thing that sits between the CPUs and the memory. Um, and its job, well, generally, the job of the cache hierarchy is to make sure all the CPUs have uh, coherent access uh, to memory. Um, between the CPU cores and the cache hierarchy is a set of ports. Between the cache hierarchy and the memory controller is a set of ports. And at least in the classic caches, there's also ports that are connecting uh, the caches together. So we will see a lot more about ports tomorrow um, when you write your own object that uses ports. So there's two different types of caches in Gem5. Uh, there's the classic caches and Ruby. Um, so it's a bit of a historical quirk that we have these two almost completely separate models for caches. Um, so as you remember, Gem5 is a combination of gems and M5. Um, and uh, gems had Ruby. M5 had, it, had its own cache models. And when they were combined, I think, this was a little bit before my time, but I think the idea was to drop the memory models or the caches from M5, but that has never happened. So instead, we now have the old M5 models that we call classic and then uh, Ruby. So Ruby is highly detailed with many different cache coherence protocols implemented. Um, and these cache coherence protocols are actually implemented in a domain-specific language for specified cache coherence protocols called SLEC, which is unique uh, to Gem5. Um, I guess maybe it goes without saying, but maybe not. Ruby here is not the Ruby programming languages, even though it does come with its own language, but that language is SLEC. Um, Ruby is the uh, cache model. We'll talk more about this a uh, little bit later as well when we talk about how to do um, modeling cache coherence in Gen 5. And then there's the classic caches, which are simpler than Ruby, so less detail. Um, and so because they're less detailed, they have, depending on the system you're modeling, they might not be the right choice. But they are generally much faster if you're using the classic caches. Um, and in some ways more flexible, in some ways less flexible, as we'll kind of see. Um, so in Ruby, the coherence protocol speci uh, specifies the hierarchy, um, but doesn't specify the topology, whereas in classic caches, the topology is kind of fixed, but the hierarchy is parameterized. I think you'll see what I'm saying in a bit. Okay. So I don't know why these are, anyway. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background on cache coherence in case it's been a little while for you. Then we are going to do an example of um, coding up a cache. So it's going to be a little bit longer coding example of doing a whole cache hierarchy. Um, but I think it's worth it. And then we're going to build on top of it later. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Ruby, although I don't think we're going to go into an example of Ruby here. OK, so quick reminder, cache coherence. So you have a bunch of cores. Each core has some private caches. Um, they might be sharing this block A. So we implement in our cache coherence protocol the, what, what, what uh, is called the single writer multiple reader invariant. So in this case, we could have multiple cores that can all read A at the same time. But if one core writes A, we need to invalidate all the other cores, uh, the A's from their caches, to keep the single writer multiple reader invariant. Otherwise, the cores might read uh, stale data. For right now, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, when we talk about implementing a coherence protocol, I'll go into slightly more detail. OK, so classic caches. Um, classic caches uh, implement their coherence protocol through a hierarchy of crossbars. This is the only kind of coherence you can implement with ca classic caches. Um, there are two different types of crossbars in the classic caches. There's non-coherent crossbars, um, and a subclass of that is uh, I.O. crossbar. And then there's coherent crossbars, of which we have L2 crossbar and system crossbar. Um, I'll also briefly note that these, so the coherent crossbar and non-coherent crossbar are the uh, models, the sim objects. 
And then IO crossbar, L2 crossbar, and system crossbar, these are actually more like the standard library instances um, or, or specifications, but they're actually not in the standard library, again, kind of for historical reasons. So as I said, um, in the classic caches, all you can do is this hierarchy of crossbars. Um, so for instance, this is one possible system or uh, cache hierarchy that you could create. So you could create such that each, um, so this is a, each core has private L1D, L1I, and a private L2, and then all the cores share an L3. Um, this is an example of one hierarchy that you can do, and this is what we're going to do. Any questions so far? Um, as far as changes to this that you could do, all you could do is like, uh, or I guess one of the things I want to point out is, um, so, so the caches have two ports, a CPU side port, which is towards the core, and a memory side port, which is towards memory. And those are just uh, single ports, so uh, ports have this one-to-one -one relationship. And then crossbars allow you to have M to N relationships. So this L2 crossbar can connect multiple ports on the CPU side to potentially multiple ports on the memory side. So for instance, this memory bus has one port on the CPU side and multiple ports on the, uh, sorry, one on the CPU side, multiple on the memory. So let's dive in and create a cache hierarchy. Give me one second to get prepared. So we are now in 05 cache hierarchies, and we are going to work on this three-level uh, .py file. So um, we have a couple of other run scripts here um, that we will use eventually. And these run scripts are going to import our private L1, private L2, shared L3 cache hierarchy, which is quite a mouthful. I think this is something that we need to work on our naming scheme a little bit. Um, so we're going to use this, so we need to create this object that we're going to use. Um, OK, so I have some boilerplate here for you. So I have a constructor uh, for you already uh, that takes in the L1 I and D size, the L2 size, the L3 size, and all of their associativities. Um, and then we need to save these sizes to be used later. Um, so the way that cache hierarchies work in the standard library um, so this is an extension of the abstract classic cache hierarchy, which is in the standard library, is that you're going to create your hierarchy, but we're not going to create, actually create the, the caches until the board calls incorporate caches on this cache hierarchy. So we'll see this in a second. So we need to save um, these parameters. Now, we cannot do self.l1d size equals l1d size. So this would, um, this would throw an error because um, L1D size is not a parameter of this sim object. So we kind of hinted at this before. If you want to add a member variable to your sim object, you have to either, it has to be a sim object, it has to be a parameter of that sim object, um, or you have to prepend it with an underscore. So that's why we use underscores here. OK, so there's a couple other things we need to do um, in our constructor. Um, we are going to, so you can kind of see that it's already used down here, but we're going to add a membus. So that's that bottom cache hierarchy that's going to be our point of coherency. And we're going to use a system crossbar for this. Um, the system crossbar sets that variable point of coherency to true. And then um, we are going to specify that the width of this, we want it to be 64. I think the default is like 32. Um, so this width 64 means that every cycle, we can transmit 64 bytes across this um, uh, bus. Um, I'll say another limitation of the classic caches are these buses are relatively low performance. So setting the width to 64, this is the peak performance that we can run this bus at. It can't do more than one cache line per cycle. So to increase the bandwidth of the bus beyond 64 bytes per cycle is, well, you can't do more than 64 bytes per cycle. You can maybe increase the cycle time to increase the bandwidth, but that comes with issues. So a limitation is the bandwidth of the caches. 
Okay, so we created this crossbar. Um, so now that we've created the crossbar, we, I have this code for you here because it's required for full system mode, which we're gonna try to support. So this is just setting things up for um, some IO kinds of things. So, so we filled this in already. So the next step is we need to implement the um, uh, cache hierarchy interfaces. So the abstract cache hierarchy that we're um, inheriting has some abstract uh, methods that we need to implement. So we have two of them here. We're def get mem side port. So we need a way. So this function is going to return. So the, we're in the cache hierarchy. The board needs a way to get the memory side ports. Um, and so that's uh, what this is. And rather than using super mem side port, uh, we are going to return um, the memory side port of the mem bus. Um, importantly, this is an S, because it's a vector of ports since we're doing a bus. And then same thing for the CPU side. Um, Um, except for the CPU side. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, same thing for the CPU side. Um, we're actually going to return the membus CPU side port here. Um, this is a little bit weird, but we need a uh, coherent access for I.O., and that's what the CPU side port is, is uh, coherent I.O. access. So that's on the memory bus. Okay. So now the main function that we need to implement is incorporate caches. Um, so this incorporate cache function, this is what the board is going to call whenever the cache hierarchy needs to incorporate so itself into the system. So it's up to the cache hierarchy to connect itself to the CPUs and to expose the right ports to connect itself to memory. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to create the caches and connect them together. Um, so first, we are going to do this thing that we just kind of need to do, which is connect the system port on the board to our membus. And apologies that there's, so there's a lot of code here that's kind of like, this is just the way you do it, and there's not much explanation for it. And the way I know you need to do it this way is I look at other implementations of hierarchies and copy paste until it gets right. Um, this is one of those things, again, for IO stuff that you just need to do. Okay, so we have that. Okay, so now we are going to connect, um, connect the caches to our memory. So in this case, we're gonna do for um, every port in board dot get memory get mem ports. Um, so for every port, so, so we can grab the memory from the board, get all the memory ports for that, and then we're going to connect this to our mem bus. So self dot mem bus dot mem side ports. Um, so I think this was mentioned previously, but this port interface, um, so essentially by saying self membus mem side ports is port, behind the scenes, these two ports are going to be connected together. So we say equals here, but really what we're doing is taking two wires and connecting them together. There's a lot of magic going on in the background. Okay, um, so the other thing we're going to do Apologies for flipping on you, but I want to go back to this picture. So we have the mem bus connected to the memory now. We have some extra I.O. stuff that's hanging off the mem bus. So the next thing we're going to do is create this L3 crossbar and then start creating our core clusters. So we're going to say self.l3 crossbar. Um, and I'm going to use the L2 crossbar. Um, 
for this. So this L2 crossbar is a coherent crossbar that has some uh, parameters set for us already. And I'm going to use it for the L3 as well as the L2. Um, you'll notice that I did not prepend this L3 crossbar with an underscore, unlike what I did on the, and same for the membus, unlike we did for these uh, parameters up here. And that's because the L2 crossbar is a sim object, and it's safe to have a sim object that's a member variable. OK, so I'm going to take a pause from working on corporate ca caches, and we're going to create these core clusters. So I'm going to kind of fast forward to creating a core cluster. So since, going back to this picture, we, we want to be able to support the system to have any number of cores. So we're going to kind of abstract away creating the core cluster that has the L1 caches, the L2 crossbar, and the L2 cache. And then we're going to return a list of these, L, uh, 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 of these core clusters. Um, we're going to use a special sim object called a subsystem that allows us to like group these things together, essentially. So I'm going to make my cluster, which is a subsystem and then start uh, creating all these caches. So let's create our L1D cache. Um, so I am going to use for the um, L1I and L1D, I'm going to use uh, the L1I and L1D from the uh, Gem5 standard library components. So there's already some uh, pre-specified L1 caches. Um, and an L2 cache, and I'm going to use those. But I'm going to pass in size is self dot um, L1D size, and the associativity is self dot L1D associativity. And similarly for the I cache. OK, so we have those two caches created. Now let's connect these caches to the cores. So there is a function that exists for us here. So we're going to pass in the core that we're wanting to connect to this uh, function in a minute. So we're going to take that core and call connect iCache, pass the L1 iCache cluster.l1 iCache dot CPU side. So I pass in the port that we want to connect to the CPU I cache to and then do the same thing for the D cache. Okay. So now that we have our L1I and L1D, let's create that L2 crossbar. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do the L2 cache and then we'll do the L2 cross crossbar. So let's do an L2 cache. It's going to look very similar. Um, all two size all two associativity and now we're going to create this crossbar um, all two crossbar or L2 bus, I think is what I called it. Um, it's our L2 crossbar. Now we're going to connect everything to this L2 crossbar. So cluster dot L1 D cache dot. So now the mem side port, I think it, or it's just mem side. Mem side of the L2 cache is going to be our L2 bus. Um, dot CPU side. Same thing for the iCache. And similarly for the L2 cache. The CPU side of the L2 cache is going to be the memory side of the L2 bus. So 
This is taking those ports and connecting everything together um, in the system. And finally, the last thing we need to do with this cluster is take the L2 cache, the memory side of the L2 cache, and connect it to the L3 bus. The CPU side of the L3 bus. Okay, and then we all cross our fingers that I didn't make any typos. Okay, so if you scroll down and look, there's a bunch of other code in this create core cluster. This is all for um, full system stuff. So this is creating page table walk caches for the I page table walk and the, uh, the, the instruction page table walker and the uh, data page table walker. It's connecting those things up and then it's doing some stuff for the interrupts as well. Uh, again, this is code that I just copy paste from other implementations whenever I create a new cache hierarchy. Okay, so we have this function create core cluster, and this at the end returns a cluster. So back to incorporate caches, let's use this function to create all of our core clusters. So we're going to say self.clusters is, we use a list comprehension, self.create core cluster. We're going to pass in a core, the L3 bus that we created above, um, and also the ISA because we need the ISA. Um, we're going to do this for every core in the board.get processors .get cores. So for every core in our processor, we are going to create this core cluster. And we use this relatively ugly list comprehension um, because we can't do cluster, self.clusters.append because it's a sub-object vector instead of a list. One thing I do want to point out here is so if you wanted to do something I don't know, super crazy, like have a different set of caches for some of your cores than other of your cores, then in this um, uh, cache hierarchy, you could kind of figure out which core was which somehow. That would be up to you to figure out. And then connect different caches up to those different cores. So it would be possible to do something like that. OK, so we have all of our clusters, and our clusters are um, uh, all hooked up. So if we go back to our picture, so we've created all of our clusters, um, hooked them um, internally, and hooked them to the core. Those clusters we've hooked up to this L3 crossbar, and on the other side we've taken our memory and connected that to a memory bus. So all we're missing is this L3 cache here. So right now there is no L3 cache specified in the um, standard library, so we need to go ahead and create our own subclass of the base cache sim object and specify the parameters for it. So down here at the bottom of the file, let's create a new class, which is L3 cache. And we are going to inherit from cache, which is our sim object. Um, don't think that, no, it's not gonna work. So if you wanna see what the possible um, uh, parameters are. You can go to cache.py, which is in source mem cache. So this is our sim object description file. Um, and base cache is where most of the parameters are. So it has things like a size and associativity. It has a tag latency, data latency, response latency. And Meyer will talk more about this tomorrow, but these, um, for the size, associativity, tag and data latencies and response latency, None of these parameters have defaults. That means we have to specify them if we're creating a subclass of this. Um, it also has parameters like the number of MSHRs, so it's a non-blocking cache. Uh, but the write buffers, that has a default of eight, so we don't have to specify that. And if we don't specify it, it will be eight. 
Um, it also has things like tags and a replacement policy, which I'm not going to dive too deep into um, today. And a few other, many other options as well. OK, so our L3 cache, this is, um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll do it this way. So uh, let's um, do the constructor. And we want to, we only care about the size and associativity for this. So that was the parameters that we have to our cache hierarchy was L3 size, L3 associativity. So we don't really care about all the other parameters. So that's all we're going to let people specify. Um, we need to call the super in it. Um, quick aside, if you ever subclass a um, sim object, you absolutely have to call super in it. Otherwise, you get the most esoteric error from Gem 5 that you've ever seen. And you stare at it for hours and hours and hours. And then you're like, oh, damn, I forgot to say super in it. And then you fix it. Um, I wish I had all the hours of my life back where I forgot to put that. Um, OK, so let's uh, specify all these parameters that we need to specify. So size didn't have a default. Associativity didn't have a default. Um, but there was a bunch of other parameters as well that didn't have defaults that maybe we don't care as much about. Um, or at least we don't want to expose these as parameters. So for instance, the tag latency. Um, so this is an L3 cache. So let's say it's uh, 20 cycles for the tag latency. Um, data latency, let's do the same thing. I believe um, the default is that tag and data are accessed in parallel, although there is an option that they can be accessed um, Sequentially, I don't know why we're getting feedback. Um, so these being the same thing, it'll just take the maximum of the two if it's being accessed in parallel. Um, self dot response latency. So this is the latency on the backwards path. Let's set that to something low. Um, the number of MSHRs. Let's say it's 20 MSHRs. I'm making up these numbers as I go. Um, targets per MSHR. So targets per MSHR is if you have an MSHR, MSHR entries, how many um, other misses can you satisfy without one entry that's to the same cache block? Um, again, kind of arbitrarily choosing these numbers. Um, this is an L3 cache. Um, so we definitely do not want it to do write back cleans. Um, why would memory need to know that something is clean in the cache? Uh, th this is needed for if you have a mostly exclusive cache behind you. And then uh, let's make it a mostly inclusive cache. All right, so I think these are all the parameters that we have to specify that don't have defaults um, in the cache. Um, and these are on the slides as well. I know I'm going a little fast, so you can grab, grab that from the slides. OK, so back to our um, incorporate caches function. So we're back to incorporate caches. So we have some, that L3 cache now. Um, so we can uh, set self so L3 cache is this L3 cache object we just created. We're going to pass in the size and the associativity. And finally, we're going to connect this up. So we need to say self dot L3 cache dot mem side is our, we're going to connect this to the memory bus. And on the other side, Um, we're going to do the L3 bus dot mem side ports. Okay. 
And finally, we have one more little code that we have, little code snippet that we have to write, which is if board dot has coherent IO. We're gonna call it set set up uh, IO cache. we need to pass the board in. So again, this is full system stuff to get IO to work. Okay. I know that was a while, lots of coding. Uh, not the Thank you. I did, what, what did I call it down here? I called it L3 bus down there too. I just mistyped it here. Thanks. Um, so you can look in the file uh, testcache.py. So here we are using a generator to test our cache to see if it works. So I have a 32K L1s, 256K L2, and a two megabyte L3. And then we just run the simulator. So let me change to this directory. And then I think we just have to run Gem five, test cache. And I did something wrong. Subsystem has no attribute L1 cache. Yep, thank you. Did I do that incorrectly or anywhere else? No, okay. Let's try again. Still something wrong. Same thing here. Um, while I'm making these mistakes, I will point out that, um, so I think Bobby will talk more about this on Friday. Um, we do try to keep a specific code style, so all of these variables in Python are snake case, uh, whereas the classes in Python are, are camel case. You'll notice this. I think line 112. Oh, another underscore. Thanks. So the options for this, um, so it says preemptive inclusivity, um, which I think is specified in this file. Yeah. So this is an enum cl class that's either mostly inclusive or mostly exclusive. Um, if anybody wants a cool way to improve Gem 5, you could make this error a better error and actually tell me what it could be when it errors. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. So after that relatively small number of errors, things actually ran. Um, and we can uh, look at the stats. So we can, let's see our So we have an L3 cache. We can see the number of misses that came from each one of these generators. So there are 2,600 misses um, for each of the generators, a total of 100,000 misses um, in this cache. So we seem to have created a cache hierarchy the way we expected. Um, you can also run, although I think it takes a few minutes, uh, this is run is um, dot py. Um, so this script um, is a little bit more complex. It has two different boards. One ARM board, uh, which 
is going to run IS in SC mode for ARM, and one x86 board that actually runs a full system version of IS. So this boots Linux. It actually uses some of the fast forwarding stuff that Jan Tong is going to talk about. Fast forwards the boot, and then it uh, starts running um, IS in full system. And I believe both of these will work. Um, so you're welcome to play around with that. If you OK, so real quick. Um, I guess we told this as well, the different parameters for the classic caches. There's also a non-coherent cache. That, so um, one thing you might think is that you could take this cache and like make it a memory size cache and put it behind the point of coherency or under the point of coherency in the picture that I drew a minute ago. Excuse me. Um, but the cache will not work in that situation because the cache assumes that's part of this coherent cache hierarchy and that behind it there's a point of coherency. And it will just break if you use it in another way. So there is a non-coherent cache which would allow you um, to use it behind the point of coherency or under the point of coherency if you need a cache that's not coherent. OK, so I want to say a couple of things about Ruby, and then we're going to see more on this later. I think we might skip this example um, and leave this as an exercise to the reader. So um, Ruby caches are different. Ruby is essentially a big black box. So um, previously, we saw like, with classic caches, there was just this cache object. And you could kind of use it to create whatever hierarchy you wanted. In Ruby, we have CPUs on one side, memory controllers on the other side, um, which are these cl the ports, the port interface. But then in the middle, where all the caches are, is just a big black box. We're going to break that box open tomorrow, but it's just a, or on Thursday, but it's just a big black box. And inside this box is the coherence protocol, the hierarchy of your caches, as well as the on-chip interconnect. So Ruby can allow you to model meshes, torus, whatever kind of interconnect you want to do, chiplet interconnects, um, whatever coherence protocol you want. So there's some built-in coherence protocols, and you can also specify your own bespoke coherence protocol as well. Um, but all of that's relatively complicated, which we will talk about later. So if we break this open a little bit and look on the inside of Ruby, so this is what's inside Ruby. Again, we'll cover this in detail on Thursday. It, it has a bunch of controllers, and you have a different controller for each kind of cache in your system. So there's an L1 controller, which is different from the L2 controller, which is different from the directory controller, which is different from the DMA controller. And you have to specify all the details of these controllers and how they interact with each other. And then out of all these controllers, you can then connect them together separately with an on-chip interconnect. So in theory, any protocol can work with any interconnect within Ruby. Any questions? Again, we'll cover this in detail Thursday. Um, OK, so Ruby components. So we have some components for Ruby um, in the uh, standard library. A number of um, a few different coherence protocols that have everything pre-specified for you in the standard library. Um, and yeah, we'll cover this more later. So I was going to do an example here. Um, and I'll just talk you through this. And uh, we can, I would encourage you to, this evening, if you're bored, or really excited about cache coherence, like I am, to do this exercise, because it's kind of a fun exercise. Um, so we're going to run an example using the messy, the messy two-level coherence protocol from the standard library. But we're going to look at this parallel for loop, where we have um, summing all the results, or summing an array into a single location. And we're going to look at three different implementations of this. So one implementation where this, this naive implementation, where each value in the array is assigned to a thread, and then you increment by the number of threads to get your next value, and they all write into a single result. So this is a really racy implementation. So there's lots of races for writing on results, and you have a bunch of false sharing um, for the uh, um, input array as well. Then another implementation that uh, no longer races on the output, but has false sharing on the write, and then no false sharing on the reads. So we chunk up the array instead of 
doing a really fine grain. And then another implementation that does chunking on the array, so there's no uh, false sharing there, and then also splits the uh, location of the result um, uh, threads at, at least a cache block granularity, so you have no false sharing on the writes. So these are you know, the kinds of optimizations you would need to do if you're writing a parallel program. So we're going to look at these three different implementations, and then have you run these three different implementations using uh, this script, uh, which uses the uh, messy two-level coherence protocol, and then actually investigate the stats where you can see and count the number of times things are false shared, the times things are read shared, and see how these three algorithms differ. Um, so here's the stats you would look at, and again, I'll let you do this offline. So in summary, uh, these cache hierarchies are a key part of Gem5. The classic caches are um, a little bit more straightforward than Ruby. Um, they're actually faster than Ruby, but they're not as full featured as what you can do with Ruby caches. Um, Ruby caches are much more detailed and can model any coherence protocol you could dream of. Um, and if you really care about the coherence behaviors, then Ruby is what you need to use. Otherwise, you might be able to get away with classic, assuming you don't need high bandwidth. 